Alrighty, well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Daphne. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. And again, I'd like to welcome you all to our presentation today in honor of Juneteenth, presented by Dr. Clyde Ledbetter. Um, first and foremost, I just want to go over some housekeeping items. Uh, we will be taking your questions at the end of Dr. Ledbetter's presentation, but please feel free to submit questions at any time using the Q&A or the chat feature in the Zoom dashboard. We will be stopping the program at around one o'clock. So if you don't get your questions answered, uh, Dr. Ledbetter is going to provide you with his contact information, and he encourages you to contact him directly um, if you have any questions. So. Uh, there will be a survey available at the end of the webinar. If you could please complete that, we always love hearing your feedback. And if you want some more information about the Juneteenth holiday um, and things in the historical context that have kind of led up to it, um, there is a web address on the screen here. I will be sending that out in the chat momentarily so you have a live link to that and you can explore that at your leisure. Um, one last thing, I just want to go over the Zoom dashboard for those of you who might not be familiar with. Uh, this is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. If you're using a mobile device, the dashboard is going to look a little bit different, but all of the features will still be there. In the bottom left-hand corner, you have your audio settings here, so you can check them if you are plugging in external listening devices such as headsets to make sure that everything is working properly. If you are having problems with your audio, you can always call into the program as well and listen to it that way. At any point during the program, if you have any issues, there is a raise hand button here in the middle. You can click on that. That'll send an alert to me and I will send you a message in Zoom and hopefully be able to help and resolve any issues that you are having. And if you'd like to contribute any questions or comments to the program, please feel free to use the Q&A button or the chat button here. We'd be happy again to take your questions at the end of the program today. So that is everything that I have for you. So I'm going to turn it over to Regina Fitzpatrick, who's going to talk a little bit about Thomas Edison's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council, who is a co-host for this event. There we go. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, welcome to everyone. My name is Regina and I'm the genealogy librarian at the New Jersey State Library. I'm a member of the events subcommittee of the Thomas Edison State University and New Jersey State Library's Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Council. The Council works with a group of highly talented and dedicated colleagues to bring awareness regarding DEI issues to the library and university community. The DEIC is happy to co-sponsor and support today's NJSL Pre Presents event. The Council was charged by the university president to generate dialogue and engagement regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion across and among members of the Thomas Edison and NJSL communities. The Council develops recommendations for training, policies, and practices that foster a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive culture for the TESU and NJSL community, promotes educational and personal development programs to further the mission of the Council. We promote use of assessment to evaluate and monitor DEI needs and make recommendations for changes that promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. To learn more about our work, we invite TESU and NJSL colleagues to visit the DEI portal. Now co-chair of the events committee, Angela Chapman, is going to introduce our speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you, Regina. Good afternoon. My name is Angela Chapman. I manage the special projects and events in the Office of the President at Thomas Edison State University and a proud member of the DEI Council. Today, I am honored to introduce our speaker, Dr. Clyde Ledbetter, who will speak to Juneteenth, a celebration of resistance. Dr. Clyde Ledbetter Jr. is a visiting assistant professor at Virginia Commonwealth University in the Department of African American Studies. He has been teaching and publishing on subjects in African world studies for over a decade. He is an alumnus of Lincoln University and received his PhD in African American Studies from Temple University in 2013 and has recently earned a second master's degree in international human rights law from the University of Oxford. 
He has taught at several colleges and universities in the US, including Lincoln University and Cheney University, two historically black universities. In addition to co-editing the book, Contemporary Critical Thought in Africology and Africana Studies with Dr. Malifi K. Asante, Dr. Ledbetter has also published articles on Malcolm X, as well as various topics concerning human and people's rights in the African world. In 2019, he researched Black high school students and their organization as a postdoctoral fellow for the University of Ottawa. Dr. Ledbetter also teaches community history courses for the African community organization, Jaku Kombi in Ottawa. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ledbetter. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. And I'm so happy to be here on uh, this, what is, what's today, the 16th? Uh, so we're in the Juneteenth season. Uh, so I'm grateful to be here today. And I'm gonna talk for about, uh, 40 minutes, uh, and then we'll open it up for some Q&A and discussion. Uh, so feel free to ask me anything that you're curious about or to make any comments as you uh, uh, listen to the presentation. So today I'm gonna be talking about Juneteenth in the context of resistance. Because oftentimes when we talk about enslavement, we, we focus on the horrors of enslavement, we focus on the the cultural dislocations, the physical, sexual, psychological abuses of enslavement, but resistance sometimes gets a backseat. And when we think about what it means to be an agent, and I went to Temple University, I studied under Malefi Asante, and one of the big things we always talked about was agency. The idea that you know people aren't just pawns on a chessboard to be moved by more powerful folks, they have agency. And resistance is the ultimate form of agency to show that, yes, I'm a victim of this system, but I'm not uh, uh, completely depowered. I will resist individually and collectively. And Juneteenth is a celebration of that resistance. Juneteenth is the culmination of almost 400 years of resistance to enslavement just in what is now the United States. So what we're gonna talk about today are some elements of resistance, some uh, uh, instances of large scale, small scale resistance that occurred between the years 1526, and I'll talk about why that year is important, and uh, up to Juneteenth, up to the end of the Civil War in 1865. So let's get started. First, a little vocabulary word. And I'm gonna be asking you guys questions as we, uh, as we go through. So feel, you're gonna to have to use the chat to see if you can answer some of these questions. But what we're talking about, and I like to title this period of African-American history is the first Chimaranga in North America. Now, Chimaranga is a Shona word from uh, what's now Zimbabwe. And it means general uprising. So. During the colonial period in Zimbabwe, there were a number of, there were two Chimarangas uh, in, in Zimbabwe, two general uprisings. One, when the British first came to Zimbabwe to colonize, and then another, when the, the, the uh, uh, folks in what was then called Rhodesia rose up for independence in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. So I like using that term because this is what it was. Ever since Black folks, first documented, the, the first documented Africans come to what becomes the United States, and it's not 1619, it's actually 1526, they resisted. And they continued to resist all the way up until the end of the Civil War. And they were instrumental in making that a successful war. Because as we'll talk about later, the Civil War wasn't going the way the North wanted it to go, where Lincoln wanted it to go, until Africans became or were allowed to become involved. Um, and then we start to see the tide turn in favor of the Union, but we'll talk about that. So that word, Chimaranga, means general uprising. So you learned a little Shona today, so write that down. All right. I want to start with this quote. It's from Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and we're talking about Juneteenth because it's now a federal holiday. The last created federal holiday before Juneteenth was Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And I always like to start with uh, Dr. King's, this quote from Dr. King, from his 1967 book, Where Do We Go From Here? Community of Chaos, um, because we need to 
really, really look at the words of Dr. King after 1963. For much, much of what we talk about with Dr. King, it ends in 1963. I have a dream speech. You might get a letter from Birmingham jail, but it's like King didn't do anything for the next five years. And every January when we have Martin Luther King Day, the writings of Dr. King and his beliefs toward the end of his life are bit rarely discussed. We get a partial portion of King. And my, another one of my goals in this talk is to make sure that as we institutionalize Juneteenth as this national holiday, we don't have a partial picture of it as well. So just a little bit from Dr. King's book, he says this, he says, the tendency to ignore the Negro's contribution to American life and strip him of his personhood is as old as the earliest history books and as contemporary as the morning's newspaper. And he's writing this in 1967, and we'll talk about what's going on today. To offset this cultural homicide, what King called it, the Negro must rise up with an affirmation of his own Olympian manhood. Any movement for the Negro's freedom that overlooks this necessity is only waiting to be buried. As long as the mind is enslaved, the body can never be free. Psychological freedom, a firm sense of self-esteem is the most powerful weapon against the long night of physical slavery. No Lincolnian Emancipation Proclamation, which is kind of part of what we're celebrating today. No Johnsonian Civil Rights Bill can totally bring this kind of freedom. So as we talk about Juneteenth today, I want us to remember King's words. Really, we need to remember them now in 2022 because uh, although last year, President Biden signed the legislation to make Juneteenth a, a, a federal holiday on June 17th, two days earlier in Texas, which is the home of Juneteenth. Juneteenth started in Texas in 1866 because for the, just a brief overview of what Juneteenth is, for those of you that are unfamiliar, Juneteenth was the day, June 19th, 1865, that General Granger of the Union Army came into Galveston, Texas, and he brought everybody together and he alerted the enslaved people that slavery was over in Texas. Texas had been one of the rebellious states that fell underneath Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which was a war tactic. Lincoln said, if I issue this proclamation and also uh, uh, allow Africans to join the Union Army, I might have a better shot of, of ending this war. So the Emancipation Proclamation didn't end slavery in the United States. That's the 13th Amendment. And even that has a caveat, because you can still be enslaved if you're locked up in prison. But it said in any of the rebellious states, once the Union troops take over that state, slavery will be abolished. But it didn't abolish slavery in Delaware. It didn't abolish slavery in uh, Kentucky uh, or um, was Kentucky, Delaware, and uh, another state, I think Maryland. Uh, these were slave states, but they had stayed loyal to the Union. So slavery wasn't abolished there. Only in the states that rebelled. And Texas rebelled. It was the last state to hear about the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. When the Africans heard it, they rejoiced, they were free. And then the next year in 1866, they commemorated the day. They commemorated the day with spiritual celebrations because it was through spirituality that they were able to sustain during the centuries of enslavement. It was through spirituality they were able to get the fortitude to resist during that time. So resilience and resistance as a result of their spirituality whether they practiced traditional African religions, whether they were Muslim, there were a number of Muslims that uh, were enslaved in, in, in the United States or Christian in various forms of Christianity. They relied on that spirituality. So they recognized that on the first Juneteenth. They always would have a sermon and this would continue as Juneteenth would grow in Galveston and throughout Texas then throughout the South and then ultimately throughout the United States. There's always a spiritual aspect to it, a sermon. There was a parade with uh, many of the Union veterans of the Union Army, Black veterans of the Union Army uh, that marched throughout the streets. African communities in Texas bought parks in Houston, in Galveston, to have a place to celebrate their Freedom Day. There'd be music, there'd be festival. Um, formerly enslaved people would get together to tell the next generation about slavery so that they would never forget what their ancestors went through. So all of this was happening and it had been happening for generations before Biden signed uh, the, the uh, order of uh, the legislation to make it a federal holiday. But while all this is going on, two days before Biden signed 
uh, uh, the, the legislation, Governor Greg Abbott of Texas signed Texas House Bill 3979. This piece of state legislation was one of dozens of laws that emerged in 2021 throughout states in the country that are supposedly quote unquote anti-critical race theory laws. What really they are, are they're laws designed to control what version of American history can be taught in schools to children. Nobody's teaching critical race theory to kids. Critical race theory is something you learn in graduate school, but it is a buzzword that has been latched onto by folks that want to preserve a version of history that is not only inaccurate, but does the opposite of what Dr. King, or does what Dr. King is, was saying back in 1967. It robs Black people of their uh, uh, true agency in American history, and it also falsifies the horrors and the injustice of enslavement, and also the genocide against indigenous people in the United States. It presents this picture that these things uh, aren't central to the founding in the sustaining of the United States during the, its early history. So he signs this bill two days before Biden signs the Juneteenth bill. And it's really interesting what this, did, what this is. In the, the home of Juneteenth in Texas, you know, part of this, and this is not the whole law, and uh, as was mentioned, there's a course website with resources on all the things I'm gonna talk about today. So if you're interested in more information about any of the topics I bring up, you can check it out on that course website. It's completely free. All you have to do is register. And my little uh, public service announcement is, you know, I got, you heard the introduction, my introduction. You heard the schools that I went to, the things that I've written, and it might sound impressive, but never listen to someone who's giving you a talk and doesn't have resources. Always double check what, what's being said. Just because somebody says it with authority, it might have a few letters behind the name, always check the information. So I've given you a head start uh, with some articles, some book chapters, some videos that talk about the things I'll mention today. And the full version of this legislation is there as well. But part of it says teachers, a teacher administrator or other employee of a state agency, school district, or open enrollment charter school may not require or make part of a course the concept that the advent of slavery in the territory that is now the United States constituted the true founding of the United States. I don't know who actually teaches that but they say you can't teach that. But here's the more important aspect of it. With respect to their relationship to American values, slavery and racism are anything other than deviations from, betrayals of, or failures to live up to the quote unquote authentic founding principles of the United States, which include liberty and equality. Now this is really rich uh, and, and hypocritical coming from Texas, that teachers can't teach that slavery was uh, a, a key value uh, and racism was a key value in the authentic uh, founding of, of the United States, particularly in Texas, because Texas was founded in part because the settlers wanted to continue slavery. That's the, one of the main reasons why Texas is even a state. A little bit of history behind that and another piece of African world history that you should know. Let me ask you all this. And you can put this in the chat. Who was the first black president in North America? And this connects to uh, Texas's independence. Who was the first black president in North America? Who knows? Who can put that in the chat? Who's the first black president in North America? Does anybody know? Eisenhower. That's a good guess. I, I love the joke is Bill Clinton, Thomas Jefferson. Um, I like Cynthia's guess, Eisenhower. Two something, the overture. Uh, close. Uh, is this a trick question? Sean Clark asked. So uh, actually, Suzanne is very close. Uh, it was someone in Mexico. And write down this name. It was Vicente Guerrero. Vicente Guerrero was of African, indigenous, and European descent. But in the case of the United States, because of how our laws were, it uh, would make him in, a black person. He was of African descent. Vicente Guerrero is the second elected president of Mexico. And he was elected all the way back in 1826. 1826, Mexico had fought an independence movement from Spain. And at the time, Texas was a part of Mexico. 
Vicente Guerrero cared not only about the rights of black people, because there is a large Afro-Mexican population, if you're not aware of that, and they're fighting to get more recognition in Mexico as we speak. There's a large Afro-Mexican population with a large history. Vicente Guerrero becomes president because he had fought in the war against the Spanish for Mexico to get independence. Becomes president, signs a number of laws. The first one being, one of the first ones being, he abolished slavery in Mexico. In 1829, he abolished slavery in Mexico. He signed laws to make discrimination against people based off of race illegal in Mexico. Ultimately though, he was assassinated by more reactionary elements uh, in Mexico that wanted to take over. But before he, he was killed, he had abolished slavery in Mexico. So you have the black president abolishing slavery in Mexico. Well, at the same time this was going on, in the 18, late 1820s, going into the 1830s, you were having mass migration of white Americans into Texas, which again was a part of Mexico. As they got into uh, 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 Texas, they wanted to replicate what was going on in the rest of the South, including holding slaves and growing cotton and, and, and all those things. They started advocating for Texas independence, largely with the desire to hold Africans as enslaved people. That was one of the main reasons that they fought for independence from Mexico. So for the governor of Texas to say that we can't teach anything that uh, does that has as part of the curriculum that slavery was one of the key institutions to the founding of, 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 of our country, it's, it's, it's a complete denial of the true history of not only Texas, but many of the other aspects of early American history, including the three-fifths clause of the Constitution, including talking about George Washington rotating enslaved people uh, between Philadelphia and Virginia so that he, uh, his slaves would never be free, um, including Thomas Jefferson uh, being, you know, uh, essentially a rapist uh, of a 14-year-old girl who was enslaved and was also his, his wife's half-sister and all that other stuff. They don't want that to be discussed. So as we are just talking about Juneteenth, we have to remember stories like this. And we have to, in 2022, fight against all of this growing movement to falsify and to ignore aspects of American history. We have to fight against that. And one of the other things that we have to do is always remember to include resistance in our discussion of enslavement. Part of the rhetoric around anti-critical race theory uh, uh, legislation is that, oh, you know, we can't have anything being taught to make, you know, students feel uncomfortable in talking about white European descended students to uh, make them feel uncomfortable or make them feel like what their ancestors did, they're somehow responsible for, and we have to make sure that their feelings are protected and there's no psychological harm. Well, what about the psychological harm that has been done for decades? to black students who only learn about enslavement and not about the resistance to enslavement? What about the harm done to indigenous students, Native American students that are sitting in class have to listen to this history about the founding of the United States, which is essentially the robbing of their land, the destruction of their institutions, the forced migration of their peoples? What about their psychological well-being? So as we progress in, 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 in are active in this movement against the, this uh, falsification of US history, we always got to have a strong place for resistance. Because when a Black student hears that their ancestors weren't just taking it, they weren't just uh, uh, facing this cultural and physical annihilation and spirit breaking uh, enslavement process, uh, you know, as, 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 as soulless figures, that they actually fought and resisted, it does something different for the student. It knows that, that, hey, oppression, I can face it just like my ancestors faced. And I can succeed just like my ancestors succeeded. And Juneteenth was a combination of that success. So let's go back a little bit. Africans coming from uh, uh, Africa into, into enslavement in the Americas begins uh, not long after uh, Columbus comes to the Americas. Now, European enslavement of Africans had actually begun in, uh, in large scale, about 50 years earlier, the Portuguese came uh, to the west coast of Africa in the 1440s, and they started kidnapping people and taking them back to Portugal. The first reason being they, they needed translators. So they would kidnap people near uh, the Senegambia region uh, and, and then ransom them back to their own people. 
Well, news got out the Europeans were doing this in the 1440s, and the first violent resistance to any form of enslavement actually happened on the African continent. There was a naval battle between Africans and Senegal against the Portuguese, and the Africans won and forced the Portuguese to go back to Portugal. Now, that didn't end the slave trade, but it shows that resistance was there from the very beginning. 50 years later, when Repu uh, Columbus comes to uh, the Americas, this is when we start to see Africans not going north to Spain and Portugal, but going west to uh, the Americas. The island of Hispaniola, what's now Haiti and the Dominican Republic, was the headquarters of the Spanish in the Americas at, at first, in the Caribbean. Uh, Columbus had set up shop there. He tried to enslave the indigenous people. They resisted. They also had uh, you know, problems with their immunity to European diseases. So uh, it was decided or suggested by a, a Catholic priest who, who later regretted this. His name was Bartholomew de la Casas. He actually regretted this later on in his life, but he suggested, hey, why don't we enslave Africans because what, it's not working out with the indigenous population. Another quick story of resistance, and, and I'll go past, uh, we'll, but it's important because the indigenous resistance often coincided with the Africans that were brought to the uh, 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 West Indies, the, the Caribbean. They would form allyship with the indigenous people. And one of the early indigenous resistance leaders whose name we should know, because I'm in, I'm connecting this with indigenous history as well, because we don't teach that enough, but it's tied, it's all tied in. One of the indigenous leaders named Hatu, Hatue, Hatue. Hatue uh, fought a resistance a, a war against the Spanish in the early uh, 1500s. And when he was finally captured and executed, the Spanish said, look, we're gonna burn you at the stake uh, for, for resisting us. Um, but before we do, you should accept Jesus into your life. We have a, a priest here who can, uh, you know, you can confess your sins, you, you accept Jesus into your life, and then after we kill you, you'll go to heaven. And Hatua looked at the Spanish and he said, um, are there Spanish people in heaven? And they said, yeah, of course. And he said, well, you know, I'd rather just go to hell. Uh, than have to deal with the Spanish people. I just love that story because he resisted all the way up until the end. But anyway, 1503, we get the first reports of Africans running away, resisting enslavement. So let's, the timeline, 1592, 14, excuse me, 1492, Columbus comes to uh, the Americas. By 1503, some nine years later, 11 years later, Africans are running away with the indigenous people and forming their own communities. In 1521, we get the first large scale rebellion against enslavement led by Africans from uh, West Africa, Senegal, from the Wolof uh, ethnic group in collaboration with the Taino nation, the indigenous people in the Caribbean, and they rebel on Columbus's son's uh, plantation. Columbus's son, Diego, had a plantation and they rebelled and then they formed their own community in the mountains. Now, all this is happening in what's now Haiti and the Dominican Republic, that island. But from that island, the Spanish began to explore North and South America as well, and, and of course, Mexico. In 1526, the Spanish uh, explorer and conquistador, uh, his name was uh, de, uh, uh, Ion, he takes a group of African, enslaved African people and some Spanish colonizers, and he sets sail from the island of Hispaniola to what's now South Carolina to try to set up a colony and what, and this is gonna be the first attempt to set up a colony in what's now North America. When they get there, the Africans, as well as the indigenous people that lived in South Carolina, revolt, burn down the colony and force the Spanish to flee back to uh, the island of Hispaniola. This is the first piece of recorded history that we have of Africans in the what will become the United States. A couple of years ago, 1619 was, was presented as like the, the year that this happened. But that's the year that Africans were first brought to places that the British controlled the United States when they were first brought to Virginia. But really the first introduction of Africans into what's in the United States is really this 1526. And what's the first thing they do? They resist and they're successful in their resistance. And they're able to form community with the indigenous people and forced the Spanish to go, they burned down the colony, they kill uh, Ion, and the Spanish are forced to flee back to, to, to the island of Hispaniola. So when we talk about African-American history, it starts in resistance. 
and successful resistance that would continue on, uh, some, not as successful as this, but that resistance would carry on all the way until 1865. So this is just a map of some of the rebellions and what they call maroon communities or quilombos. Quilombo is another African term. It's spelled Q-U-I-L-O-M-B-O, -O, quilombo. Sometimes it's spelled with a K, but it comes out of Central Africa and it means war camp. Um, the Spanish called them maroon communities or palenques. Uh, these were places where Africans were able to escape enslavement and they would set up communities. Sometimes in the case of the Great Dismal Swamp in uh, Virginia, it'd be a swampy area that was hard to, uh, hard to be uh, accessible. Same thing in uh, the bayous of, of uh, uh, Louisiana. This was a phenomenon throughout the Americas where you had these quilombos, you had these maroon communities. So that was one way Africans would resist. But then they would also revolt. And between 1526 and as more settlers pour into the Americas in the 1600s, 1700s, and, they, and Africans were enslaved in Virginia and Georgia and Pennsylvania and New York and, and, and Massachusetts, they resisted cultural resistance, individual resistance, slowing down work, acting like they were sick. And then the large scale revolts were planned and plotted and dozens and sometimes hundreds of Africans would plan and plot to destroy the uh, system of enslavement where they were. Some were more successful than others. I'll just talk about a few. Uh, you know, there were so many of these that we have a lot of records of the ones that didn't actually occur because unfortunately somebody snitched. And uh, on that course website that I've given you, uh, you have access to other courses that I've done. And again, it's all free. And I did a course a couple of years ago on snitches and sellouts because people asked me, they said, you always talk about people that snitch, now it ruined movements. Could you do a whole class on that? And I did. And you'll see that throughout the history, Africans planned revolts. They were gonna burn down plantations. They were gonna destroy entire towns and get free. But then sometimes, a lot of times, somebody would snitch, you'd have a sellout. And we still got sellouts in 2022 too, but it's a different discussion for a different time. But there was a rebellion in, in Goose Creek, uh, South Carolina, the same state the first rebellion happened. And the house being informed by Captain Davy Davis that a Negro man of his had been and was the chief instrument in discovering a dangerous plot and conspiracy designed among the Negroes in Goose Creek quarters about two years ago, uh, for which he was promised a reward, ordered that the Negro man named Job had the sum of five pounds paid to him. So he ratted out an entire conspiracy uh, for five pounds. This is the stuff that was happening. But it didn't stop a, a number of these things from happening. So that's 1713 in South Carolina. Going back to this map, in 1741 in New York City, Africans from what's now Ghana had been uh, enslaved in New York and they burnt down what's now Times Square. There was a huge rebellion in New York. Rebellions all over the United States. Uh, uh, the Carolinas, Africans would take advantage of the fact that for much of the history, so the Spanish controlled Florida and the Spanish made a deal with the Africans. They said, hey, if you can escape, we don't have enough men uh, to, to, to control Florida to, and we don't want the British to have Florida. So if you can escape from Georgia, if you can escape from South Carolina and make it to Florida, we'll give you your freedom. And uh, in exchange, all you have to do is we'll give you some guns and you need to protect the border from the British. Think about that, that, that proposition where you're going to, Give me freedom, number one. And then number two, you're going to give me a gun so that if former slave masters come into the territory, I get to kill them, sign me up. So you had a number of Africans that escaped from Georgia and South Carolina into Florida. Same type of thing when the British, uh, when the United States got independence. And part of the uh, reasoning for US independence from Britain was the British were talking about ending the slave trade. And the big planters like, Washington, like Jefferson and others said, oh no, this is one of the reasons why we need to go ahead and break away from the British. In addition to, you know, not wanting to pay their taxes because, you know, it's, it was so oppressive for, for, for these rich white men. They couldn't pay the taxes on stamps and tea and all that uh, and stuff. So when they revolted from the British, the British did the same thing that the Spanish did. And Africans were smart. Again, this agency, because the Europeans would just talk about politics and talk about all these things and the Africans would be serving dinner and they'd hear all this. And they knew how to play Europeans off of each other. They knew that when the Spanish and the British were fighting, 
there's a place for us to get freedom. When the Americans and the British were fighting, there's a place for us to get freedom. So when the British said, we'll offer freedom to any African that fights with us, 20,000 Africans took them up on that offer. 20,000 Africans during the Revolutionary War fought for the British. 5, 000, you hear about the 5,000 that fought for the United States, the Crispus Addicts, uh, the, 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 the other folks that fought in Massachusetts, and they're, they're celebrated, but they're a minority. Most Africans said, you're going to arm us to fight against former slave masters and give us freedom? That, that's an easy sell, and they fight. All of this was, was in the, the context of serious revolts and rebellions all over the region. In 1760, we got Tacky's Rebellion in Jamaica. Uh, in Barbados, what's now British Guyana, you have Amina's Rebellion. The big one was Haiti in 1791. Started in 1791 with the, uh, the Black Cayman ceremony. This was where the Africans in Haiti got together. They had a religious ceremony and they vowed to destroy slavery in Haiti. And by 1804, they did that. So between 1791 and 1804, you have the Haitian Revolution. And Haiti was the symbol of African independence because they actually got free. They beat the French, they beat Napoleon's forces, they beat the British who tried to come in and the Spanish who tried to come in, and they were able to establish an independent country. In Jamaica, you had the Second Maroon War, 1795. You had a Ponte's Rebellion in Cuba in, in 1812. Buses Rebellion in Barbados, Kwamina's Rebellion, another rebellion in Guyana. So all of these slave rebellions were happening. And the Africans in the United States were influenced by these, particularly the Haitian independence, because news got around. As slave masters ran from Haiti, they ended up in New Orleans, and they brought their enslaved Africans with them. Africans that worked as uh, slaves on us uh, and, and also free men on sea vessels took the news of the Haitian Revolution all over the Americas. They said, hey, we have our own country. The Africans won. So this inspired Africans to keep up the fight, to keep plotting, to keep trying to poison their masters, to keep trying to uh, set fire uh, to the plantations. So 1804 is Haitian independence. In South Carolina, so we go back to South Carolina, because this is, South Carolina was a state most like the countries in the Caribbean where they had an African majority population in South Carolina. So uh, South Carolina, 1822, we have Denmark VC, who's plotting, and he is a free man, a pastor in the AME church who had, was born actually in the Caribbean. He got his freedom, but he continued to struggle for the freedom of his brothers and sisters. He plotted with a, nut, with a group of, of, of other Africans, and they were eventually able to coordinate somewhere between 6,000 and 9,000 Africans in this plan. They were gonna storm the city in six independent unions, uh, of, storm the city of Charleston. They were gonna capture weapons. They were gonna set fire to strategic areas, recruit more Africans. And then the ultimate plan was we're gonna plunder the banks and then we're gonna set sail to Haiti. That was the plan. And we know about all the planning because Unfortunately, there was a, a snitch. There was a snitch. <laughs> Major Wilson's boy, George, who was a spy. Uh, and, and there was a, 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 the, 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 the snitch told his master and uh, it was um, found out before it could be executed. But here's the interesting thing. I love this quote because every time one of these rebellions would happen, there would always be a trial. There would always be a record because the, the slave masters wanted to know how can we stop this from happening again? We need to make sure that these Africans aren't doing this again. So we need to get all the information. So bring in all the, we're gonna to torture people. We're gonna bring in our, the, the slaves that are willing to sell out to tell us everything that happened. So they were in the process of arresting people. And one of the folks that got arrested was the coachman of a, a big time planter in the region named Elias Ori. And when they were arresting his coachman, the guy that drove his horse and buggy, Elias ran out of his house. He said, no, 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 no. My, this slave, he was so good to me and my family, he couldn't possibly be involved in the rebellion. You got the wrong uh, uh, black, the wrong Negro. He couldn't possibly be involved. And as he was being arrested, and he knew what his fate was going to be. The coachman turned around and he looked at his master or his former master and he said, listen, it had our plot succeeded, I was going to kill you, rip open your belly, and throw the guts in your face. That's how much of a good slave I am. So oftentimes in these rebellions, it would be the so-called house slaves. Because a lot of times people put that dichotomy in a field slave and house slave, and you had sellouts in both uh, contingents. 
But oftentimes it was the slaves closest to the masters that would knew what was going on, knew when the masters were weak, and they would be the least likely to rebel, but they were oftentimes some of the leaders of these rebellions. So I just love that quote because he just he just busted that guy's whole uh, idea of what a good slave was. In addition to other rebellions, again, this relationship between the Africans and indigenous people. As those Africans that I mentioned earlier from Georgia and South Carolina made their way to Florida, eventually Florida becomes part of the United States. But those Africans had formed a new nation with indigenous people, the Creek, who had left Alabama and Georgia because there was a split in the Creek nation. There were some Creeks that were interested in uh, becoming like the Europeans. They took this deal that they were gonna become quote unquote, one of the civilized tribes. But then you had another faction of the Creeks that said, no, we don't want no parts of America or the British. So we're gonna go to Florida. And that portion of the Creeks that went to Florida became known as the Seminoles. And not just them, but also the Africans that left from Georgia and South Carolina that formed a new nation with them it was all called the Seminole Nation. Seminole actually means breakaway or runaway. So it refers to the Creeks that separated from their nation, as well as the Africans that, that came from uh, South Carolina and Georgia. They formed this nation that fought hard against the United States in the early 1800s, all the way up until the 1830s and 40s. These are known as the Seminole Wars. These are some of the most successful uh, indigenous wars fought because the indigenous people were fighting to keep their land, and then the Africans were fighting because they knew if they were captured, they would be put back into slavery. So these were hard fighting uh, uh, men and women that fought against people like uh, uh, General Andrew Jackson who would become president, one of the great bigots to ever be in the White House. Um, so they fought and one of the heroes of this was a man named John Horse, another name that we should talk about. I'm gonna go kind of fast and there, uh, so there might be questions. But I just wanna introduce some of these little known figures. John Horse was an African person who was a member of the Seminole Nation, who uh, was a leader who had fought against the United States. Ultimately, they uh, were unable to completely defeat the US. Uh, so they had to sign a deal. And the, the treaty was that they would be moved from the, uh, Florida to what they called Indian territory. This is where they were putting uh, the, all the people that they said that they were going to allow to stay in their lands in Alabama and Tennessee and Georgia, the Cherokee, the Creek, the Choctaw, were all forced on that trail of tears to Indian country, to Oklahoma. So they said the Seminole Nation has to go to Oklahoma. We're, we're getting you out of Florida. And John Horse, as the leader of the Blacks, you're responsible for the Blacks getting to Oklahoma. They knew that they, 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 the, the war was over, they couldn't defend their land, they go to Oklahoma, but the Africans knew that Oklahoma was a slave uh, state. Even there were some indigenous people that even owned slaves. So John Horse gets to Oklahoma and he continues to lead the people. He continues to lead the blacks and they make their way from Oklahoma across the border to, uh, to, into Texas and then into Mexico, into a city called Nascimento. From Nascimento, John Horse and the African Seminoles make raids into Texas to free other people going all the way into the 1830s and 40s, they're fighting on the border between Texas and Mexico and leading people on the Underground Railroad to Mexico. Oftentimes we hear about the Underground Railroad to Canada, but there was one going into Mexico as well. Throughout the 1850s, there were a number of arsons and uh, uh, rebellions throughout Texas until ultimately we get to the Civil War in the 1860s, which is not going well for the United States, I mean, for the Union for the beginning part of the Civil War until Lincoln issues that Emancipation Proclamation and also issues the order that Africans will be allowed to fight in the war because at the beginning, Africans weren't uh, allowed to fight in, in the Union Army. When they do that, that's when the war starts to change for the Union Army. So when we talk about Juneteenth, it wasn't like Africans were just waiting to get independence, waiting for somebody to tell them that they were free. No, they were fighting. Even before Lincoln said that you can fight, Africans were fighting, they were walking off the plantations. They were weakening the Southern economy. And no greater example of this is the great Harriet Tubman. And I'll end with this. Harriet Tubman, we know her for her uh, courage on the Underground Railroad, freeing people from slavery. But what's often not talked about about Harriet Tubman is the fact that she's the first woman, not black woman, the first woman in US military history to lead a combat mission. And she did so with the, her uh, leadership of the Combahee River raid in South Carolina. Again, going back to South Carolina. This is June 1st, 1863. Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 
1863, this military operation, June 1st, 1863. Harriet Tubman had been in this community as a spy. Now, again, she's the most wanted woman in America for all the activities that we all know about. She's going into the deep South. She infiltrated this community. She talked to the enslaved people about what the Southerners had, where their weapons were, everything. And she said, one night we're going to come along this river. We're going to help burn down the plantations. We're going to free all of you. And she talks about later on when she's interviewed, that night, because of her intelligence and her leading this operation, she freed 700 people in one night. 700 Africans were freed by this woman and her military genius in one night. And again, this is what these stories are on top, but these are the stories that we need to talk about during Juneteenth. And other African soldiers that joined the Union that fought in Georgia, that were in Sherman's March to the Sea, that fought uh, uh, in, in Texas, in Louisiana, to help free their brothers and sisters, to ultimately lead to the Union victory. This is what needs to be remembered during uh, Juneteenth. These types of struggles, this type of resistance, resistance. So as we go into the weekend and as you have the day off on Monday, remember these stories and the other stories of rebellions. Uh, teach about them. And we have to continue to resist, not slavery at this point, but resist the erasure and the falsification of U.S. as well as world history concerning African people, concerning indigenous people, even concerning uh, poor white folks, concerning Latinx people, and whoever else are marginalized in this country. So we need to make sure that we do that and I'll stop there and open it up for any uh, questions or comments. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Ledbetter. I must say that was very educational for me and just based on the reactions in the chat, yes, everyone thinks that that information was amazing. So thank you. Um, I'm just gonna backtrack to a couple of questions that we had while you were speaking. Um, we have multiple questions that we're asking about John Hansen. So why is John Hansen not considered the first black president in North America? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, so John Hansen was of African descent. Um, the Articles of Confederation was the, the legislation that he was the president under. Um, and the Constitution replaced that. So the president under Articles of Confederation didn't have a lot of power. It was a really weak system of government where the states had more power. So though there was a number of presidents under that setup, but they're not really given a lot of credit. But yeah, he, is, he considered one of the people that could fall into that list as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, definitely. All right, and we have another question. Uh, what is being done about publishing real history books for schools who wish to teach factual history? Are scholars working on this along with the curriculum? I think more work needs to be done in the textbook uh, industry. It's a tightly controlled industry, to believe it or not, because people know how powerful we are. So a lot of school boards have deals with particular publishers, so it's hard to break into that. And, but the, 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 the bigger challenge is not even just getting the textbooks, but fighting against these laws that even if teachers want to, if they have the, the, the state approved textbook, but if they wanna bring in other sources, they have to be careful that there's not uh, a student in the class or a parent that says, we don't want our kid reading this or uh, another administrator in school that will report to because teachers are afraid of losing their jobs. Uh, so we have all of this going on. So the key thing is to fight against these laws to make sure that they're not passed. And also in addition to that, creating spaces where this history can be taught outside of the schools, the churches, community centers, that type of thing. During the time where Black folks were you know, in segregated schools, it was the church, it was these other institutions. And I know right before uh, we got on, um, uh, it was mentioned that uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha uh, was one of the people that helped promote this event, one of the institutions that helped promote this event. It was the sororities and the fraternities uh, that spread this information about Black history, that created the documents and the resources for Black teachers who weren't getting funded by the states to, the, to, to teach this information. So we might, we, we, need, we shouldn't never stop doing that in the first place. Our churches should have still been doing that. Our institutions should have still been doing that. But we got to step that up again. Because just because they're saying that the schools can't teach it doesn't mean that we don't let it, it shouldn't be taught. That's another one of the reasons why I do what I do in terms of the Saturday classes that I hold, in terms of the course websites I create for free, because we got to just get this information out as much as we can 
outside of the university, outside of necessarily the school system. We got to just teach, 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 be consistent with it and use uh, 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 events such as this to, to, to keep it going. Okay, to somewhat piggyback off of that, there's an idea that declaring Juneteenth as a federal holiday is not enough mm -hmm. to do, you know, to basically address the impacts of slavery and its impacts on society. Do you agree that June, Juneteenth isn't enough? And what do you think can be done for it, for it to be considered enough? It, when, uh, when President Biden signed the legislation, um, there's a black political scientist named Wilbur Rich, and he talks about president, he, has, he writes this article about presidential leadership and, and race. I can't remember the exact title, but he brings up two concepts, racial acknowledgement gestures and structural improvement policies. Now, just declaring Juneteenth a federal holiday is a racial acknowledgement gesture. It doesn't, it's not, it's not gonna cost the country any real money, you know, people being off, but it's not gonna cost any real money. It's not gonna change things for black people as a group, but a structural improvement policy will. President Biden said in his address that he was going to do some structural improvement policies, things around housing, things around uh, 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 closing the wealth gap and different things. So there's a number of things that can be done on the federal level and on the state level. Starting with, I think, uh, really making sure those Pigford farmers, if those of you not familiar with the Pigford case, for decades, the United States Department of Agriculture discriminated against black farmers resulting in the 20th century of black, uh, the black community in the United States losing millions of acres of land. And now this case went before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, yeah, there's clear discrimination and these black farmers deserve to be uh, remunerated, but there's been holdups with it. We need to get that straight. That's a, that's a good place to start. We need to think about loan forgiveness for black students. We need to think about uh, uh, housing, because we know about the past discrimination in housing. And ultimately, this, this question of reparations need to be given serious uh, consideration. So these are structural policies that can be put in place. And we need to go back and read Martin Luther King's Where Do We Go From Here, Community of Chaos. Because Dr. King gives a number of recommendations that nobody talks about, about a revolution of values in our country and what we could do economically um, but that's why that, that book isn't talked about and we only get came from 63. But there are a number of structural improvement policies that would not only benefit black folks, but also uh, poor people in this country as a whole. Uh, so yeah, that's where we, that's where it needs to move. And Biden said that he would do some of those things. So it's important for Biden supporters and supporters of, uh, uh, of other folks or anybody that's following any political party, this is what you should be pushing for. Um, to make sure that these things become uh, a reality. Right. Um, there's also an idea that calling Juneteenth, Juneteenth National Independence Day will become a point of division, somewhat like how Columbus Day is divisive and Independence Day can be considered divisive. Do you think that that's going to be the case with Juneteenth? It doesn't have to be. It, it doesn't have to be. Again, when we talk about Juneteenth, it can be a holiday of unification. Like I mentioned in this text, Africans resisted, but, and, and from the beginning, but we had help with indigenous people. We had help with folks that would be considered Latinx people. We had help from poor white folks. You have people like John Brown, you have abolitionists, you have others that saw that this system was against humanity. And because they loved humanity so much, they were willing to sacrifice their own white privilege to assist. So Juneteenth, if we tell the, the stories the way they need to be told, can be a day of unification uh, uh, to, to show what can happen, what can be accomplished when we let these uh, uh, backwards ideas of racism and class division uh, uh, cloud what we can do as a people. So I think it can have the opposite thing. Only if we treat it right, tell the stories the way they need to be told and, and uh, are honest about it. Got it. We have another question um, related to the history. What role, if any, did Frederick Douglass play in supporting Juneteenth since he had a good relationship with President Lincoln? <laughs> Very good relationship with Lincoln and other presidents. He becomes one of the first black ambassadors. Um, to be honest, I don't know exactly about Douglass's relationship with Juneteenth itself. 
I'd have to look that up. And I think I will, it's an interesting question. But I do know Douglas's relationship to the 4th of July because he writes, he gives this, this brilliant speech in 18, either 55 or 58, but he's, he, so for those of you who don't know, Frederick Douglass had escaped slavery from Maryland and he was pretty much operating uh, in Canada as well as uh, up, upstate New York. And he was invited by a group in Rochester in the 1850s to talk, uh, to give a 4th of July address. And he titled his address, What to the Negroes the 4th of July? Why would I celebrate the 4th of July? I know you brought me here to, to talk. He said, well, why would I celebrate the 4th of July when it's not freedom for my people, we're still enslaved. So he gives this, this, this critique of uh, celebrating the 4th of July while Africans are still enslaved. So I can't celebrate your freedom while we're still enslaved. So I don't know exactly about his relationship with Juneteenth. I, he, maybe he gave speeches because he lived, Freddie Douglass died in 18, in the 18, early 1890s or the 1880s. Um, so he lived a long while Juneteenth was being established. So I would be curious to find that out. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a good question. All right. And I'd like to get your thoughts on a current event uh, surrounding mm -hmm. Juneteenth. I'm sure you heard, but last month, Walmart received backlash on social media for selling a brand of Juneteenth ice cream. Walmart removed the product, but they continued to sell third party t shirts that were modeled on people who maybe it should have been modeled on. So, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on corporations trying to capitalize on Juneteenth? Should it be off limits? Corporations will try to capitalize off anything. I mean, we just need to look no further than both uh, Black History Month and Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, I've seen all types of outrage, outrageous things connected to Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, the things I won't even mention on this call, but they, we have to protect against that. We have to make them solemn days. Again, like I mentioned, one of the key aspects of Juneteenth was the spiritual nature of the day because black folks had relied on their spirituality to get them through and also to fortify them in their resistance, it, it had that element to it. So we have to fight against things like that. And I'm glad Walmart was forced to take that down. Um, and in addition, we need to fight against, you know, the continued exploitation of workers by corporations like Walmart and Amazon and the others. So in the spirit of Juneteenth, we have to realize that struggle continues. Not, might not be slavery, but if there's oppression and exploitation of workers, we need to be fighting against that in Juneteenth as well. So um, yeah, that's just a continued fight that we need to have. All right, and I have one more question. Um, do you have any recommendations for books on Juneteenth for both adults and children? Yes, and, and a lot of those are listed on the course website. Um, so uh, there, I'll put the list back up. I'll give you one quickly because I was just looking at a good one this morning. Let me find it and I'll put it in the chat um, because it was a uh, it was a well put together one from actually uh, from Virginia Commonwealth University professors. They asked a bunch of us to to put together a list. So this one is um, came out today actually. So I'll put that in the list, um, and then you can also look at the course website and see uh, what we have. Uh, there available. All right, and I will turn it over to Tara because we are hitting time. So okay. thank you. No problem. Thank you so much, Christina and Dr. Ledbetter for a truly powerful, highly informative and engaging discussion. Thank you so very much. I'm Tara Kent, an Associate Dean at the University and Co-Chair of the DEIC Events Subcommittee. We thank NJSL Presents for hosting this program and for allowing the DEIC to be a co-sponsor. Staff at the University and the New Jersey State Library can learn more about the activities of the DEIC on the University portal and are invited to join us for upcoming events. On June 22nd at noon, we'll host a discussion about the documentary film, 13th. In celebration of Pride Month on June 28th at one o'clock, we'll host a lunch and learn titled, Queer History, Remembering the Reason for Pride. And on August 17th, we'll host a talk titled, Implicit Biases and Microaggressions, What They Are and What We Can Do About Them. Staff may register through the university portal. To learn more about the upcoming events sponsored through NJSL Presents, 
please visit the New Jersey State Library website. Events sponsored by the NJSL Presents are open to the public. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at future events. Have a good afternoon.